On the morning of July 9, 1995, four-year-old Ashley Holmes ran to her neighbor's house naked and with her hands bound with rope. She was standing at my bed and she was shaking her hands like this. My mommy's dead, my mommy's dead. When the sheriff's office arrived, they discovered that Marianne Holmes, who was 29 years old, was beaten upside the head and she was sexually assaulted. And it all happened with her two babies sitting there on the bed watching all of it. Look at this town. It's a nice, safe, little sweet town where they have no murders, much less something like this. The person who committed this crime wasn't just a murderer. He was evil. This is the kind of freak that we would love to get off the streets more than anybody. Our victim is brutally murdered in front of her two little girls. Ashley did a <coughs> drawing, and she showed basically what looked like a hatchet inside of her mother's head. This is a case in a league all by itself, committed by someone that premeditated and planned and thought it out ahead of time. Whoever came there brought everything with them. They brought the handcuffs, they brought the rope. Because it was such a violent crime, there was an enormous amount of evidence collected. Now after 18 years, we can finally submit this evidence for DNA testing. I think our chances of finding the killer have never been better. I've seen hundreds of murder cases, and this is the kind of crime that gives you chills. This case affected everybody involved. I can still remember it like it happened yesterday. And it affected me that these two girls grew up without their mother. It has been 16 years and still no answers. At least consider her killing a cold case. Years later, the case is still unsolved. There are so many cold cases out there just waiting to be solved. The crime scene ultimately tells the story of the murder. We want to bring justice to these victims. Hi. Hello, ladies. Hi. This is Yolanda and Kelly. Kelly. Hi, Yolanda. Terry Johnson. I called my good friend Alan Brown from the Houston Police Department Homicide Division to study the case. We've all looked at it, but we're eager to learn more to see what else we can find out. Back when this happened in 95, 18 years ago, who was working here then? I was just a patrolman at that time, and they called me out early that morning. I mean, I don't know how to describe it. It's something to this day that, that we, we think about all the time. Where I was the only investigator here, we just didn't have the manpower. They had time him and his unit, and they so kind of took it over. So you got assigned to it? I was asked to assist in November or December <laughs> of 95. Over the years, people call in with different things, and just nothing ever been panned out. Everything's gone to a dead end. So let's go show us everything, and then we can start talking to all of them okay. first. I have an emotional attachment to this case. Marianne's oldest daughter, Ashley, calls me almost on a daily basis. She's kind of adopted me as a father figure. It's very important to solve it, not only for Ashley, but the entire family, because they want closure. Tell us about Marianne first. Marianne was originally from the Chicago area. She left and moved to Arizona, and she was more of a, wanted to be a stay-at-home mom. Going to college here at the local junior college, she had joined the, the Mormon church. She was focusing on her children. And I know she talked to several of her, her friends and said that she wanted to find a good man. Marianne did want to find someone who could be a good daddy to her babies. Unfortunately, there were a lot of men in her world that were losers, and any one of those could be the killer. Now, on July 9th, 1995, Ashley, Marianne's oldest daughter, went to a neighbor's house and said her mother had been killed. Marianne was found in a fetal position. She was bound by handcuffs. Her clothing had been cut off of her. And she had obviously been dead for quite a while. The autopsy report revealed that she died of blunt force trauma to the head. It, it's, by all appearance, he sexually assaulted her post-mortem. Vaginally or anally? Both. 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 I think he, used he inserted he used an he instrument. Used out right. He spent at least two hours in that house torching her. Wow. What happened with the little girls? Ashley was tied, her hands were bound with rope and her panties were cut off by the killer. That just gives me the creeps because you think of her watching her babies there. She knows what's fixing to happen to her. She's not stupid. This guy's a monster. There's her baby. She thinks they're gonna die. 
That's horrible. That's the thing. In a sadistic killing, the fear that the killer causes to the victim, that's the turn on. Way back when it happened. Yes, ma'am. What did Ashley tell tell y'all that she saw? She referred to, to the killer as a lion man. Uh, and a lot of people started <coughs> speculating as, as far as, did he have long hair? Was it, did it look like a mane on a lion? Did he have a tattoo of a lion? She said, when I get scared, I bury my head. But she says she looked over and in that doorway, I seen a great big guy. She says, kind of like you and pointed to me. Ashley did a drawing of the scene. If you look at that drawing and compare it to the photographs of the scene, they are real close. Okay, so let's talk about the suspects. David Black. Now, his father owned the home that Marianne lived in at this time. I thought David was actually working on the house. The back door could not be locked. Supposedly, Mary Ann paid him $200, and the repairs were never made. He definitely would have known the layout to the house. And he lives in the house. He lives in the house now, where yep. the murder occurred. Once David Black moved into the house, he started making really weird statements about feeling a special connection to the case. He made comments that I can't move out of this house because I feel closer to Mary Ann. How long has this been going on that he's been acting like that? That's him. I mean, he's just like way out there. OK. Do you think that when you approach him about coming down here to talk to y'all, he's going to come? That's iffy. OK, who's your next one? Philip hey. Turley. He knows Marianne because he works at college. He kept, like, a diary or journal, and a lot has to do with Marianne Holmes and how he feels about her. And it just really seems like he cannot come up with the courage to even ask her out. He redrew house plans to include her in an art studio and her kids' bedrooms, and he hadn't even dated her. OK, what about this guy? John Bercy. John Bercy was an individual that Marianne was deathly afraid of. I think in her words, she described him as a con man. They broke up. She started talking about, if anything happens to me, he did it. He's your front runner, right? Yep. <laughs> we have been trying to locate him. I have multiple intelligence analysts working on it. It almost looks like he disappeared off the face of the earth. Seriously. As if this board isn't bleak looking enough, on this very day, we have a garage sale or a yard sale. According to a lot of the witnesses, there were a lot of people there. So it could be a stranger. And it could have been someone who was there just looking around, sees that she's by herself, don't see a man, see two young girls. So we got a lot to do. I think the first thing we ought to do is go meet Ashley Holmes, Marianne's daughter. She's uh, 22 now. What's different about this case for us is that our family member was part of the crime that night. Ashley? Yolanda McClary. Ashley might not have been hurt physically, but emotionally and mentally, she needs to have this person taken off the streets so that she can feel safe and get on with her life. Tell us what you think about all this. I mean, it makes me nervous to be here. Shortly after her mom was murdered, Ashley and her little sister went to live with her grandmother out of state. The killer could still be living in this town, so I'm sure she's terrified by that thought and also just about having to come back. Tell us about the favorite thing you remember about your mom. Um, we used to read every night before I went to bed, so we would always cuddle together and everything. Sometimes I get really sad and I'm just in this place where it's like I feel like a four-year-old again and I just want my mom to wake up. She should have been here. She wanted to be a mom really bad. She wanted to be with us. I should have had her, you know. How much do you remember? I remember the next morning really well. OK. Um, and I remember before it happened pretty well. But it's kind of a blur in between. A black hole in That's probably normal, yeah. don't you think? I think so. Yeah. Over the past 18 years, through interviews and therapies, Ashley's tried her very hardest to come up with information that would lead to who killed her mother. But because of how young she was, we just want her to know that she shouldn't have to worry about that anymore. Because you know what, baby? Here's the thing. There's nothing you're ever going to remember that's going to solve this case. It's not going to happen. So no pressure. It's relieving. We're going <laughs> to yeah. talk to everybody we can think of, try to find out whatever we can, okay? okay? We're doing this for you. It means a lot to my family. 
think it's just time to let it go and just know that it's in someone else's hands. We'll be on the south side, David's house is on the north. Okay, David's house is here. The tin roof with the tan SUV in the driveway looks like. As always, one of the first things we want to do is go to the crime scene to get an idea of the actual space. That means getting one of the suspects who lives there to let us inside. Wow, that is a little house. Sure is. David Black has a history of being paranoid and sometimes dangerous, so the investigators need to take a special approach in figuring out a way to convince him to let us inside the house. Are you serving someone? No, no, we just come to talk to you for a minute. I'm Kendall Curtis with the police department. I'm an investigator that was brought in to look into Mary Ann's case. If I will be honest with you, it has to do with this fundamentalist LDS religion. Those people believe that if somebody denies the faith, that it's your obligation to shed their blood. Right now, Alan and Kendall are talking to David Black, one of our suspects, and obviously they haven't talk him into letting us come in yet. This Marianne is not the first one. I feel like she was assassinated by special forces. They killed her. It killed me. It killed my dad. It killed two or three other people. Oh, hold on, guys. My phone's going off. Alan just let us know that they're not getting anywhere useful with David. He's still spouting out conspiracy theories. And unfortunately, he's also unwilling to let us investigate his house, which is our crime scene. That would freak him out to have five people walking around the house. Uh, I agree with you. Let's go to plan B. Yeah, yeah I think it'd be a good idea. David Black's not going to let us in, so here's where we're at right now. We're going to do a mock crime scene. Does this look pretty, it, it pretty looks clear? Pretty, it pretty looks much pretty like close it. to me, yeah. So we can stand back and go, all right, this is what my room, short of the walls, would have looked like. Now, here's our key point, the door. The door that she couldn't lock. We know that the back door to Marianne's house did not lock. She rented the house from a man named Roy Black. He said that he would send his son, David Black, to fix the back door. David never fixed the door, and it became the point of entry to this murder. Since Mary Ann and the girls slept in that living room, you would never be able to see an intruder coming through this door and down this hallway. This is all solid wall. They wouldn't see anything until their intruder is literally in the doorway from the kitchen into the living room. One of my thoughts was that Mary Ann is actually facing her intruder. She is struck in the head right on the left side of her head. And it was probably the first blow. Your person would be right-handed. She also has a lot of blood on her hands. When you hit your head, what's the first thing you do? Oh, geez, you grab your head. Now, we have a rope that's involved that goes around her neck, and we have handcuffs. There would be handcuffs in front of the victim. This is the moment that Marianne was probably dazed, so this might have been the time that the killer tied up Ashley, handcuffed Marianne, and tied a rope around her neck, too. She knows not good things are going to be happening to her in the next moments or hours or whatever to come. The literature marks on Marianne's neck are kind of weak. I don't believe that the killer's intent was to strangle her, but instead to use it like a leash and control her. Now this all comes to the ground here. This is our heaviest really thick blood saturation. She has some pretty good abrasions on her elbow. She has abrasions on her knees, so there's no doubt she's down this way, okay? He cuts off her clothes. My theory, the suspect was possibly having sex with our victim before she was dead. And now all of our wounds are pretty much on the right side of her head, going all the way around to the forehead all came pretty oh, simultaneously. Man. Within a couple of blows, I'm sure she goes yeah. unconscious. It's a horrifying scene, there's no doubt about that. Just to sit here and realize 
I, I sound stupid, but the bed, I didn't know the bed was this close. Yeah. And it all happened right there, and those babies are on this bed, and you gotta believe that Ashley saw every bit of it. Being at the mock crime scene and really being able to see how close it was when it all happened really motivates you to want to catch who did it. We have a lot of things pointing in the direction of John Bercy, the man Marianne was dating when she moved to Thatcher. Even though Bercy claims he was in Florida at the time of the murder, we need to find witnesses who can tell us all about that to see what they have to say. Okay, let's go hope she's here. Barbara Abbott. Barbara Abbott. She started running around with him. You mean John Bercy? Yeah, John Bercy. You call him John or Jack? Jack, I guess. All right, go ahead. Right away, sweeping her off her feet, wanting to get married. So anyway, he was nothing but a liar and a real smooth con man at that. So what happened is he used to talk this bullshit for so long, and Marianne got really angry, and she was like, I hate your guts. I want you out of here. Just leave. And how was he acting when y'all were kicking him out? Oh, he had a violent temper. When Mary Ann and John Bercy broke up, she moved to Thatcher to get away from him. She was definitely running away from a relationship that had gone bad. I could see in her eyes that she was scared. I do know one thing. She actually got phone calls from him, and that was probably two weeks before she was murdered. Hello. Hi, is this Naomi? Yes, it is. Naomi, let me ask you something. Sure. This story about this very, very upsetting phone call that Marianne got. Did, did you remember her saying? I can tell you an incident that happened before she was killed. All right, talk about that. It was probably about 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning, I don't know. And somebody was pounding on my door. It was Marianne. And she was shaking, and she was so scared. She'd gotten a phone call, and it was him. And she was just terrified because he knew where she was now. Sheriff's office. Hi, um, I've been contacted by a person that I previously had a, a problem with, and they just basically called me to tell me that they, they knew where I was, and I am, I am a little scared because if he comes to my door in the middle of the night, and then I call you guys, you know what I mean? This is Chief Woods. This is Dan Stanley Call. I got Deputy Sheriff come by and gave me your number and said to call you. John Bercy's alibi is that he was staying with a man named Dan Stanley and his wife in Florida at the time the murder occurred. No matter the threats, no matter what John Bercy has done previous to the murder, if his alibi is solid, it doesn't matter. Do you remember the name John Bercy? Yep. We met him because our truck was running bad. John and I drove his truck and pulled my Jeep. In your original statement to the police, you said that you and John left Nevada on June the 30th, 1995. And then y'all drove across the country all the way to Jacksonville, Florida, and arrived there sometime around July the 4th. So the critical question is, between July 4th and July the 11th, did he leave for any significant amount of time? I would have to say no on that because he didn't have a dime to his name. He was with me all the time. Is your wife there, sir? Yeah, hold on just a second. The original investigators locked Bercy's alibi with Dan Stanley, but I see nothing where they talked to his wife. Hello? Miss Stanley, do you recall the time frame that we're talking about, the guy we're talking about? Yes, I do. He didn't disappear long enough to go to Arizona and get back to Florida before he got arrested during that time period, right? Oh, no, absolutely not. He oh. was there with us. And he wouldn't have had the money to go anywhere in his old beat-up truck anyway. John Bercy's alibi is about as solid as an alibi can be, I have to say, but I still want to wait for the DNA just to make sure. She's scared to death of Bercy, and she should have been because he's a freak, and the one that's after her that she never saw coming could be our killer. We're investigating the 18-year-old murder of Marianne Holmes. We've confirmed the alibi of Marianne's ex-boyfriend, John Bercy. So now we're gonna focus on David Black, the man who now lives in the home where Marianne was murdered. Did he ever talk about Marianne, the young lady that was murdered? All the time. I know he's absolutely obsessed with that murder. Do you think David would have done that? I will say this, I think it's a possibility. He hears voices, and the voices talk to him. 
and the voice is telling stuff. I think he's capable of listening to the voices and going nuts. So back when Marianne moved into your home that you were renting to her, did you ever become friends with Marianne? No, I didn't get real close to her myself. Marianne died July of 1995. Uh-huh. Okay. Was David living here with you at the time? No, he was living out in Salt Lake, Utah. Oh, okay. He was in Utah. Do you know of any kind of relationship between he and Marianne at all? Not to my knowledge. He was up going to school and working out in Utah. David Black still seems real suspicious, but he's not talking to us. Well, thank you for coming down. You bet. So there's not a whole lot more we can do in that direction to try and determine what to do with him right now. Kendall, meet you in here. It's right with you. Hey, guys. Hey, Chief. Hey. What's going on? David Black is here to see you. Get out of here. He's right out there, and he's got a bunch of documents he wants to show you. You know, it seems to me like David Black's father must have told him to come over here and talk right, to David. us and explain to us where he was that day and to try and clear his name. There were some actions that brought you to our attention. Your father rents the house. There was word that you may have done some repairs because at the time her house was having some repair done on it. And so in any investigation, you look at you look at the people who had access. We know that David had met Mary Ann when she rented his father's house. And he was supposed to repair the broken door that the killer entered, but he never did. I should have brought this out sooner because uh, this does have some things I think are helpful. Can I see this for a minute? Sure. David Black brought writings from his journal that indicate that he was in Provo, Utah, both before the murder, after the murder, and on the dates of the murder. Do you have, through like the fifth, I guess the sheet before and the sheet after this? I have the whole year of 95. Everything he wrote in his journal in regards to his girlfriend, the school he was attending, and where he was working, it all checks out and proves that he was nowhere near Marianne's house on the night of the murder. We'd like to get a DNA sample, swab. I'll be happy to do that. Okay. Just put it on the inside of your cheek and just kind of wave it around a little bit and stick them in the box. This evening, would we be able to come back to your house, look around again, and walk through it? Okay. This evening. Now that David Black has given us an alibi, he's given us his DNA, not really feeling it on him being the suspect, but I am going to take him up on taking that tour of that crime scene. Hello. David. Hey, David. Hey, man. Well, we came back because you told us we could walk around the crime scene. Right ahead. Okay. Thanks, man. We appreciate it. Sure. The footprints come right back this way and come right in the gate. We're going to show the first shoe print that we're finding. I want to retrace the shoe wear impressions that Kendall and his guys found to see where they went. They went around this way, yeah, right? Yeah, they went around the back side of the house. They went okay. right up to this window. That's a great yeah. shot right in. Yeah. The shoe prints themselves tell a whole story about how our suspect walked around the house to that kitchen window that you could so clearly see into the living room. It's all very eerie and creepy. Footprint headed away from the house here. You can kind of see where this footprint is hitting as we look west. The trail of shoe prints leaving the property shows that the intruder went in a northwest direction towards the college. In this area right here, was the last two prints that I was able to find that went that way. And they Detectives went... at the time of the murder investigation measured the shoe impressions and determined that they were between a size 11 and size 13. While all of our suspects in that size range, only one of them worked at the college. One of our suspects is Philip Turley, who very familiar with the school, very familiar with the area. Yeah, he... Philip Turley was working at the college, which is close to Marianne's house. It's actually where he met her and fell in love with her. So he would probably know I could park here. No one would think anything about it. I, I know my direction right back to it and gone. Yeah. Are you all excited? You're so cute. <laughs> it's almost like looking at your lottery ticket when it's rolling, you know? Today we're getting the DNA results back. We're hoping that we can get a DNA profile on the suspect. Over 50 pieces of evidence went to Sorensen Lab. It was the most I've ever seen. An ink ribbon's gonna run out before you print 140 pages. We know the weapons used by the killer were brought by him because none of these weapons belong to Marianne. 
anyone who would do this kind of a crime and bring his own murder weapons with him to the house probably also wore gloves. But what I'm hoping for is he bought those sometime way prior to the murder without gloves. And that's where we're going to get our DNA. All right, let's first take our handcuffs. On the handcuffs, we have no DNA. Well, that's frustrating because we know our killer brought those there. Then we have the rope on our victim. There is DNA detected on it. Unfortunately, it is so slight that it is inconclusive. He bought the rope someday, somewhere, and he put it in his garage. He didn't do it with gloves. That's why I thought the rope would come back. Now, I do have something interesting on the bag of clothes. The threshold on it was still too small to develop a profile that could be compared to someone. But this piece of DNA could exclude. It excluded John Bercy and David Black. I also have two picture frames also on the crime scene. Again, it did the same thing. It excluded John Bercy and David Black. But they have Philip Turley's and they cannot exclude Philip Turley, right? Exactly. They've, they've had Philip Turley's. They compared Philip Turley's and they can't exclude him. DNA profiles are unique to each person, but sometimes we only get a partial small profile. In that case, it can't be used as an exact match, but it can be used to exclude people. Think of it like a lottery when you only know a few of the winning numbers. In this case, David Black and John Bercy didn't have any of the numbers. So there's no way that they touched the evidence and now they can be excluded. But Philip Turley does match a few of those numbers, so we're not going to exclude him. Danae Langley is Phil Turley's ex-girlfriend, and uh, she sounds like she's more than happy to talk about how crazy their relationship was. Says Langley. Hey, I'm Kelly. I'm Steve you... Carter, Thatcher Police Department. We need to talk to you because okay. you're crucial to the case. Ex-girlfriends are always a great source of information in these cases, but it's tricky because you need to make sure that there's no uh, payback involved in what they have to tell you. But I don't want to be on camera. Okay, you don't need to worry about, about that. Truth. Danae has said some pretty incredible things about Phil Turley, and being able to talk to her today will give us a better sense of what to do with that kind of information. You're our very first person in the world of Phil Turley. Okay. Danae, did you know Marianne Holmes? Phil Turley had told me that they were engaged to be married. He referred to Marianne as his fiance. He told me that he bought land in Pima, Arizona, and that he was building their dream home that they were going to move into when they got married. Now, when he said that, I knew that he couldn't even afford to go buy a motel room for one night. What kind of crazy is he? Well, I know that he was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. When he's on a high and he's not taking his meds, he becomes psychotic. We know from your transcripts and your notes and your other conversations that he talked a lot about kinky sex stuff, too. I do remember that he talked about somebody on their hands and knees going around on a leash on a collar and maybe whipping them or spanking them. He was obsessed with anal sex, and I didn't want to do that. Why do you say obsessed? How often did he Because he would never let it go. He just kept Always. on and on and on, bringing it up and wanting to do that, and I just didn't want to do that. That made him mad. We know from our crime scene that our suspect used handcuffs on Marianne, but we also know that he put a rope around her neck and dragged her away from the couch, where he then sexually assaulted her vaginally and anally with some unknown object. Danae's statements about Phil Turley's sexual habits have a lot of eerie coincidences and similarities to our crime scene. He worked as a correctional officer, and he said that whenever the prisoners wouldn't come out of their cell and cooperate, that the correctional officers would have to go in and use their batons and beat the prisoners into submission. He said that was the favorite part of his job. Did he have correctional gear? Did he have, like, his belt and handcuffs and baton? Did he have that stuff? Whatever correctional officers had, that's what he had. What's the most violent he ever was with you or talked about with you? One thing that he said that I could kill you and then I could F your dead body and there's nothing you could do about it. He talked about it like it would be really fun for him, but I would suffer. He said that he could commit murder in this valley and get away with it. Hey, I'm Detective Curtis from Thatcher Police Department. We have reopened the Marianne Holmes case. Our interview with Danae Langley was really helpful, but you always want to get more information by talking to everyone who has firsthand knowledge of your suspects. And that's what our plan is next. Philip Curley, does that ring a bell with you? Oh, 
I believe he did it. Right after that, he he didn't show up for work anymore. He didn't even quit. He just never came back. What would be your opinion of Philip Turley, thinking back of him? He's psychologically crazy, and he held a gun to his head, and I told him I was going to call the cops. And then when I did, he disappeared. And I never heard from him again after that. The reason why I left is because we got into an argument, and he took a swing at me and put a hole in the wall. Really? Any other big, big blow-up moments? There was one time um, when we were in bed having sex that he had tied me up. Uh huh. But the power that I felt when he pulled my legs down to tie them just made me shut up and not say nothing and go along with it because I got scared. We've talked to all the women in the life of Phil Turley, so we have a good idea of the kind of man he is. And now it's time for Alan and Kendall to go find Phil Turley and talk to him face to face and assess whether or not for sure if he is the one who murdered Marianne Holmes. I'm Kendall Curtis from the police department. Okay. And Thatcher. Anyway, we looked into the old Marianne Holmes case. We just doing some follow up and on that. And I didn't that. do it. Well, I'm not saying you did. Here's the deal. My life was pretty much destroyed in that. Well, well, that's why I don't live okay. there now. My well, business is gone. Okay. But that's what we're trying to do. Uh, and how are you going to make it right? Well, maybe this will help clear a lot of things up. Sweet. Phil Turley now lives a few hours outside of Thatcher, so we're going to take him to the local PD to interview him there. Oh my God, he's bigger. Than, he's big. We're just going to go upstairs. Okay. That's coming in loud and clear. Unless Phil confesses, we cannot pin this on him at this time. We have no eyewitness. We have no DNA. Honestly, what we need is a miracle. Obviously, you were very fond of Marianne. At what point did that relationship progress into more than just a work, professional type relationship? Well, it never progressed into any kind of relationship. We'd seen each other a couple of times. Mm -hmm. We met each other at two church functions, mm -hmm. and we went to a movie. Do you remember when the police say to multiple items from your house. In that, they took your diary and thought about being in love with Marianne. I don't think so. My mind, my imagination is working. And over time, this evening, my first thought was Marianne. My love deepens by the hour. On 7-1 of 95, now this is exactly one week, seven days before the murder. It's odd. I barely know her, yet my heart is all hers. Okay. So my question is, did you ever really go to the movie? Yeah. But you never write about it. You've got nothing going on with Marianne except in your head. And it's all right around the time that Marianne turns up dead. What do you think about the kids being left untouched? You have any inside thought on that? Around the time of the murder, one of Phil's friends approached the police and agreed to let himself be wired. In the transcripts are a few suspicious statements made by Phil. The most unusual being why Phil theorizes that the killer left the children there unharmed. I have no clue why you would leave the kids to grow up with that. So we had somebody who said that you said, leaving the children untouched, I want that kind of power. The children know it was there, and that's power forever. I did never say that, no. You didn't? But no. You ever been volunteering your girlfriends? I don't think so. Heaven with the name. What about your sexual interest? No tying anybody up? I don't know. I might have tied Danae up. I don't think so, though. I don't remember. How about handcuffs? No, I didn't own handcuffs. Oh, that was a good one. Because more than one girlfriend says handcuffs. It's not just Danae. That's good. You know, the way I see it is, you have this whole fantasy built up, and you have this perfect life. She's like the ready-made family. And in your mind, you have all these plans, and she poof, shoots you down. Rejection is not a problem for me. But all your suicide threats are made when you're being rejected oh, no. by a woman. There are many times. There has to be some motivation, some catalyst to push you into that direction. No, there actually doesn't. That's normal and true, Graham. That's the problem. I'm a difficult person. But I don't kill people. Would you be shocked that I said that I have DNA in there that I can't exclude you? No, but I don't think you were lying. Yeah, I figured you would. There's a lot of unexplained things, man, that don't make any sense. Some things I don't have answers for. We're not going to break and solve this case. Not today. Not with these answers. He's bipolar. So he gets a pass on a lot of them. And he gets a built-in explanation for being a kook. Because he's not doing it today. 
Bottom line is he's smart enough. He ain't gonna confess. No. And we're gonna take you back home, but I have a feeling we'll be revisiting again. I would be more than happy to talk to you guys again. Matter of fact, if you call, I'll drive up there. You don't even have to come down here. Make it easy for you. What do you think after looking at him? I, I still think he's in... I, I can't rule him out. You don't have a case. No, we don't have no. a case. I think he's a kook, and I think he can't handle rejection. But his answers, you know, when you have to, you have to always remember that he's bipolar. Yeah. The fact that Phil Turley is bipolar adds reasonable doubt to this case, and there's no way of avoiding that. Without any more evidence, it's going to be just as probable for a jury to believe that a random killer is who did this to Marianne Holmes. So the worst part is we have to go tell Ashley that we didn't solve the case. Oh, God. Ashley is sitting here, and she wants us to be able to tell her that we're there. We know who killed your mom. And walking up to see her to tell her the news is really, really hard because well, I know what it's going to do to her. It's going to, it's going to hurt her. It's going to break her heart. Hey, Ashley. Hi. Hello, Miss Ashley. How are you? Good, good, good. Hey. You look cute. Yeah. Um. Ashley, unfortunately, this week we were not able to find enough evidence to tell anybody for sure who killed your mom. There is a suspect that they're focusing on, but there's also still the chance that whoever did this to your mom is somebody out there that we might not ever catch, okay? You should know that because of you, the DNA has been tested. They're now going to focus on one person. They may or may not solve it. But what you should know is that whether they solve it or not, you cannot control. And you need to tell yourself that you are moving into a new phase of your life. You go back home. You go back home and you think about what you want to do for your career and your, and your school and where you're going to live. And don't think about this anymore. You don't. Okay. You need to let it all go, okay? Your yeah, well, mom's talking to you. I know. I have this amazing family, but there's this huge hole, and no one, I mean, it doesn't matter how many aunts I have or how many best friends' moms that I kind of adopt as my own, you know? Nothing ever fills that. I just want everyone to feel better. You can't fix it. So stop trying. She's always worrying about everybody else. Her little sister, her uncle, her grandma. She's trying to fix everybody else, and I want her to know that she needs to fix herself. I did a lot of death penalty cases, and the families, they put their lives on hold, waiting for that execution to, like, make them feel better. And then they walk out, and they're like, that doesn't That's fix it? anything. That doesn't fix anything. And if you ever find out who did this to your mom, it's not going to fix your life. You make your life good. You're supposed to move on and you're supposed to feel better about everything, but at the end of the day, like, I just want my mom. But I know that I'm gonna get up tomorrow and the sun's gonna be shining and I'm just gonna have to keep going, you know, you can't stop. Thank you. If you wanna call us and email us and vent or ask questions or you hear something new, we would love to get a call 25 years from now because you're not worrying about this anymore that right. something happened. Before she died, Marianne wrote a series of letters to Ashley, and one of them reads, you cry when I put you down or get out of your sight occasionally. I don't want to spoil you, but I do want to make sure you feel loved. I want you to need me, but I also want you to feel good on your own. 